pastors here at Grace Church. It's a joy to be in God's house, to worship God, to thank God for his love. You know, he loves you more than you'll ever know. Let's just thank him. Can we do that? I just feel like right now we ought to thank God for his love. Thank you, God, for your love, your unconditional love, your steadfast love, your eternal love. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Hey, nudge somebody and say, I love you, appreciate you. Good to be sitting beside you. Hey, I want to talk about, well, the subject is called My Bad. Let's practice. Let's say that. My bad. My bad. One of my favorite movie actors is Samuel Jackson. And, uh, but he's had some kind of odd movies over the years. There's one movie that really just shook me up a little bit, Deep Blue Sea. I think he's down in this depths of the sea and sharks are there and the shark gobbles him up and he's gone and halfway through the movie he's, he's out of here. But there was a, a movie that came out in 2006 and um, it just, I've seen bits and pieces of the movie, I haven't seen the whole movie, it's called Snakes on a Plane. And first of all, now wait a minute, planes by themselves, you know, I have a little issue, I have claustrophobia just getting on a small plane, but then you add snakes to the plane. I, I'm not even going to watch the movie. Um, but he's got snakes on a plane, and he just cusses nonstop. The whole movie's just well, Because the more snakes you have, the more cussing you're going to do, I guess. that's the. So, so what I'm trying to say is that I, I hate snakes. I cannot stand snakes. Snakes bother me. Snakes trouble me. Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't know anyone who likes snakes. I don't know, any, there's no one in my family because snakes are creepy, snakes are sneaky, snakes are extremely poisonous, some of them are, excuse me, um, wait a minute, Hey, I think the reason why most of us are not fond of snakes goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. So let's go ahead and look at the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Notice how it reads here. It says that the serpent was, was clever, more clever than any wild animal that God had made. He spoke to the woman. All right, I stop right there. That bothers me right there. He spoke to the woman. Do I understand that God told you not to eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, not at all. We can eat from the trees in the garden. It's only, uh, it, we, he said only in the middle of the garden that God said don't eat from it. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? Don't even touch it or you'll die. The serpent told the woman, you won't die. Everybody say liar, liar, pants on fire. You won't die. God knows that the moment you eat from the tree that you'll see what's really going on. You'll be just like God, knowing everything ranging from good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree looked, everybody say looked, the tree looked like good eating and realized what she would get out of it, that she would know everything, she took and ate of the fruit and then gave some to her husband and he ate. Immediately, the two of them did see what was really going on. They saw themselves naked. They sewed fig leaves together as makeshift clothes for themselves. It says, when they heard the sound of God strolling in the garden in the evening breeze, the man and his wife hid in the trees of the garden, hid from God. God called the man, where are you? Now, Adam just should have said, my bad. No, he didn't. He said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid. God said, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from that tree I told you not to eat from? The man said, the woman that you gave me. The woman that you gave me as a companion, she gave me fruit from the tree and yes, I ate it. God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? Well, she said, the serpent. She should have said, my bad. No, she said, the serpent seduced me. 
And I ate, God told the serpent. Well, because you've done this, you are cursed, cursed above all cattle and wild animals, cursed to slink on your belly and eat dirt all your life. I'm declaring war between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He'll wound your head and you'll wound his heel. So this is, this is mankind's first recorded encounter with a snake. There are two things in this story that that trouble me deeply, that seems strange to me. It appears that snakes were able to talk and walk back then. That is weird to me. Wow. We, we just read that snakes were very clever. As a matter of fact, they were more clever than any other of the animals that God had made. They were smart. They could communicate with people. So Eve was deceived by the smooth talk from this snake. And then God cursed all the snakes to slither on the ground and had caused this natural hatred between people and snakes. This is where it all began. But there's something else I think we should see in this and that, that is the woman's offspring would crush the head of the serpent's offspring. And there are many theologians that, that believe that this verse is a prophecy of how Jesus Christ would ultimately crush the kingdom of darkness. Well, whatever the case, the serpent in this in this garden was able to walk and talk and Adam and Eve were deceived by what he did and then snakes were cursed to crawl on the ground. I, I think that, that this revelation gives us insight to what's going on behind the scenes. There, there's another revelation, it's in the book of Revelation and it shows how this reptilian power came to earth to begin with. It's in Revelation 12, look at verse 7, it says that war broke out in heaven. And Michael and his angels fought the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back. They were no match for Michael. They were cleared out of heaven. Not a sign of them left. The great dragon, and it says the ancient serpent, or that old serpent called the devil, Satan, the one who led the whole earth astray, was thrown out. The angels, all of his angels were thrown out with him, thrown down to earth. Then I heard a strong voice out of heaven saying, and this is the good news here, that salvation and power are established. The kingdom of God, the authority of his Messiah, the accuser of our brothers and sisters are thrown down who accused them day and night before God. Look what it says here. They defeated him through the blood of the lamb and through the bold word of their witness or their testimony. So Christianity, we've got to see as more than just a commitment to moral behavior. It's more than just a commitment, I'm just going to live right. No, it has to do with teaching our eyes how to view the blood of Jesus and then how to share our testimony of salvation with others. Because these two things, the blood of Jesus and the word of our testimony, are powerful tools to overcome the serpent's bite. But it all hinges on our ability to see why we need Jesus in the first place. In John chapter 3 and verse 14, look what it says here. Jesus said something very strange. Now we all know John 3, 16, John 3, 15, but look what it says in John 3, 14. It says that as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so will the Son of Man be lifted up. That's weird. Now, before we figure out what's going on here, let's go back in time. Let's, let's look at the story of Moses. And, and before we see this bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, let's look at, at why Jesus was referencing, referencing it and, and go back to the Old Testament, the days before God's people were led out of Egypt, before the Exodus, before this great epic event. We know that Moses, first of all, was a Hebrew. He was put in a, in a basket of bulrushes by his mother to, to spare him, but Pharaoh's daughter found him. She took him into the palace and nurtured him as her own child. History tells us that, that Moses lived in luxury. He lived in affluence. He was groomed and educated by Egypt's best, the best mathematicians, the best astrologers, the best scholars and scientists. And so Moses was set up to inherit all that Egypt had to offer. You see, Moses knew that he was different. He knew that, he, that God had different plans for him, that God had bigger things in store for his life. And so he not only saw the suffering of his people, amazingly, the scripture says that Moses saw Christ. 
How did Moses see Christ? Christ wasn't even born yet. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. It says that it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he chose to suffer the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. Look what it says in verse 26. He thought it was better, Moses thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. How was he able to do this? For he was looking, he was looking, he was looking ahead to his reward. It was by faith that Moses was able to leave Egypt, not fearing the king's ang anger. He kept on going and going and going, why? Because he kept his eyes on the one who was invisible. It was by faith, the scripture says, that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover. Somebody say Passover. That Passover lamb to sprinkle the blood on the doorpost and the angel of death would not kill their firstborn. I want you to just look at this and, and, and gaze upon it and absorb this. Moses was only able to do what was right because he was able to see right. Somehow he saw Christ. Somehow he saw the power of Passover lamb and he knew that a reward was coming for he and his people. And I think by the same token, it's true for us that if we see Christ, somehow that will enable us to know that a reward is coming. Just like Moses and his people, God will rescue us. God will heal us. God will enrich us if we keep our eyes on Jesus. So the exodus from Egypt happened because Moses viewed the blood of the Passover lamb the right way. Not only were they set free, the scripture says they were made healthy, they were made wealthy as they left Egyptian bondage. The Bible says that as they left that night of Egypt, there was not one feeble person, not one sick person in all their tribes. Millions of people left that night, but there was not one sick person. And also, a side note, on their way out of Egypt, God convinced the Egyptians to give the Israelites all of their silver and all of their gold. So they left healthy and they left wealthy. The physical health and the physical wealth is just a metaphor, though, of something greater, something eternal. Come on, somebody. When we look to Jesus Christ, when we look to the cross of Jesus, something eternal happens in us. It's more than just a commitment to moral behavior. It's, it's way much more than it. It has to do with teaching our eyes how to view Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, look at what it says here. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded with such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin, that little chihuahua sin that you've got that so easily trips you up. You got to say my bad to that. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. The champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame. He's now seated to the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility, it says, that he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. See, here's the deal. Sometimes we do not see Jesus like we should. We don't, we, okay, we believe in the cross. Yeah, that happened 2,000 years ago. And so then it becomes just a historical fact. Pastor Brett talked about facts and truth. Yeah, the cross is a historical fact, but there's more truth to that. There's more power in that. It's more than just an historical event that happened 2,000 years ago. So sometimes we, we pride ourselves on doing all the right things and obeying all the right rules and avoiding being bad. This is what we do. And, and, and so man's religion, the religion that we can get caught up is that we pride ourselves in being right when really Christianity is all about seeing right and it involves admitting when we are wrong, admitting that we are wrong. When, when we see the cross correctly, when we, we see the love of God poured out up, upon upon us through the cross, and, and it's expressed in this dynamic way, but in another sense, we see our spiritual sickness when we look at the cross. We see our spiritual poverty when we look at the cross. So before we can be healed, before we can be enriched by the goodness of Jesus Christ, we've got to see that we're sick. We've got to see that we're poor. We've got to, see, we've got to say, my bad. When we look to the cross, we need to say, my bad. I put Jesus on the cross, that's my bad. 
We don't want to say that, though. We don't want to say my bad. I don't want to say my bad. In Revelation 3, 17, Jesus told the church in Laodicea, he said, you say I am rich. You say I have everything I want. You say I don't need a thing. And you don't realize, you don't, this is, these are church people he's talking to. You don't realize that you are wretched. Turn to somebody, no, don't do that. You are wretched. You are miserable. You are poor, blind, and naked. You can't get any worse than that. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. But look what Jesus said. I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me, and you will not be shamed by your nakedness. And then he said, buy some ointment for your eyes so that now you can see. You can see right. See, this church couldn't admit they were wrong. These Christians couldn't admit they were wrong because they were trying so hard to be right. Trying so hard to be right. And so I think, ironically, seeing Christ the right way is when we see that Jesus is the only way to correcting the wrong that is in us. We are desperately in need of Jesus. Not just for one-time salvation. Oh, I needed him when I first came to Christ, I, but I need him more now than I've ever needed him. We must never get over getting saved. I feel like a kid in a toy store. I am just so excited about myself. I can't even believe I'm saved. I don't deserve to be saved. I don't deserve to preach this message tonight. Who am I? It's my bad. But somehow he saved me. Somehow he healed me. See, the problem with God's people is that after they escaped from Egyptian bondage and God, they, 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 they kept the Passover and the blood of the lamb, they ate the lamb. There was healing in all their tribe. They left wealthy and rich. They forgot the one that had delivered them. They got a little cocky. See, there are two things that happen when we see Christ the right way. The first thing that happens is that we, we, we get eternal health. Not just physical health, but I'm talking about eternal health. I'm talking about longevity of life. I'm talking about eternal living where you never die. Eternal health. And this keeps us healed of the serpent's bite. Just keep looking to Jesus. See, because of Adam and Eve's rebellion in the garden, we've been, we've been bitten by a snake. We have. Poisoned with the idea that we can be good on our own. We can pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, as they used to say. And so Satan has lured mankind away from God. And, and so Paul warns the Corinthian believers in the church in Corinth. He says, you need to be careful lest you are lured away from the simple message of Jesus. It's a simple message. It's not complicated. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he said, I'm afraid that your mind, I, I'm just afraid, folks, that you are going to be led astray from, from, from following Jesus, just as Eve was tricked by the snake. So Paul brings this up. This is a big deal. Just as Eve listened to the serpent talk and rebelled against God's command, we've also been affected. I've been affected. You've been affected. Now, to further illustrate this, let's look at what Moses and the people of God did after they got into the wilderness on their way to the promised land. It's in Numbers chapter 21. You've got to see this. This is, this is amazing. So they left Mount Hor, Hor and went on the road toward the Red Sea in order to go around the country of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. That's me, I think, right? Just underscore that and say, that's me, I get impatient. They became impatient on the way and grumbled at God and Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in the desert? There's no bread, no water. We hate this terrible food. So the Lord, he just sent fiery serpents. It's in the Bible. Fiery serpents, they, they came from everywhere. They started biting the people. And many of the people died. This was a serious thing. So the people came to Moses and said, Moses, we've sinned. We're bad. My bad. We've done wrong. Pray that the Lord would deliver us from these snakes. Take away these snakes. 
That's what Samuel Jackson was saying on that plane. Take away these snakes. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said, I want you to do. What I want you to do, I want you to get a bronze pole, and I want you to make a bronze snake. Yeah, this is in the Bible. This is the weirdest stuff. And anyone who is bitten, if they just look at it, somebody say, look at that. If you just look at it, anyone who looks at it, if they've been bitten, that person will live. So Moses made a bronze pole, put the snake on the pole, and when the snake bit anyone, if that person looked to the bronze snake, they would live. That's in the Bible, isn't it? That is weird. I have always been weirded out by that. See, not only was Jesus leading them and feeding them and getting them out as Passover lamb, they, they forgot that. And, and they become, became prideful and they became rebellious and doubted God's provision. And they pushed their luck and they were bitten by all these snakes. As I said earlier, we by nature are rebellious, stubborn towards God. Instinctively, we turn away from God. It's, it's in our nature to sin. The lust of the eye keeps us looking at the wrong stuff. I don't want, we're not going to put on the screen the stuff that you may have seen in the last few months. No, we're not going to do that. But we got snakes all around our lives. Pastor Brett preached a powerful message about the belt of truth. We are in a spiritual war. And we need truth in our lives. And the, the truth is, is that there are snakes. Satan is around. He's, he, he, he is trying to trick us and to lure us and to poison us with sin. So we're bad, we do stupid stuff sometimes and get our lives in a mess. That's why Paul used this Old Testament story to remind us to stay focused on Christ. Look what he said, Paul, Paul used this same story. In 1 Corinthians 10, 9, he said, we should not put Christ to the test. Let's don't do this. As some of them did and they died from snake bites. Paul is referring back to this Old Testament story. Because of not trusting in Jesus, we put Christ to the test. And the snake has bit us again. The good news is that when Moses lifted this up, they were healed. The, how ironic. The remedy to their snake bites was to look at a snake. But you've got to think about this in a deeper, deeper way. Okay, let me... You know the World Health Organization? The World Health, who? The World Health Organization. Their logo for World Health is the rod of ecliptus. It just so happens to be a snake on a pole. You go to the doctor, the doctor's got the snake on a pole. American Medical Association, snake on a pole. And they say this is from Greek mythology, the rod of Ecliptus, and that's fine. I just say it's just another reminder that all sin, all disease, all sickness, everything wrong with the planet is pointed back to the devil, to sin, to, to Satan's deception, to that old serpent, the lies of the old serpent. So without Jesus, we're, we're sick. Without Jesus, we're going to die. Without Jesus, we're wretched, poor, blind, and naked. And the only way to see Jesus right is to see why we need him in the first place and why we're always going to need him. So once again, when I see Jesus hanging on the cross, I don't say this in a flippant way. I say, my bad. Jesus said, in, 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 this is interesting, in, John, in Luke uh, 5.31, Jesus said, it's not the healthy people, it's not the healthy people who need a doctor but it's the sick. He said, I didn't, I didn't come to invite the good people, but sinners to change their hearts. In other words, if you don't think you're a sinner, and if you don't see your need for Jesus, you won't be saved. But if you look to the cross, you look to Jesus, and humbly say, Jesus, I need you, you will be healed, you will be saved of all that your sin has, has done in your heart and made you bad. And so the, the only way the good news of Jesus works for us is to accept the bad news about us. God is a loving God. God is a forgiving God. And something happens when we look to his 
the greatest display of love, his greatest, he, he gave his son to die on this cross and it heals the hurt, it heals, it cures all ills. It takes the poison of sin out of our lives. We become new creations in Christ. We're justified, we're sanctified, we're made right in the eyes of God. And I think sometimes we look for the wrong things to heal the hurt in our lives. We, some people here might be looking for that, that right relationship or you're looking for that right experience or that right job. That We want to be right and we want everything to be right. But the only thing that removes the poison and fixes all that's wrong is the rightness or the righteousness of Christ. This is not a new kind of theology. This is old. You know, Jesus made this comparison. We're, we're familiar with John 3.16, but let's look at it again in John 3.14. Jesus said, as Moses, Jesus said this, as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. He's talking about the cross. So that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but will have eternal life. God sent His Son into the world, not to judge the world, but that the world would be saved through Him. This is good news. This is amazing news. I don't want to ever get over getting saved. I don't want to ever lose my zeal and excitement for this. Just seeing how much He loves us doesn't matter what you've done. You say, I've done a lot. It doesn't matter what you've done. You may have broken every rule in the book. It doesn't matter how many sins you have committed. When you look to the cross of Jesus Christ, you will not only be forgiven, you will be eternally healed. You will live for... It's as simple as that. Don't let the snake fool you. Don't let the snake deceive you. See, religion has been complicating this for so many thousands of years answer to everything everything every unhealthy relationship every unhealthy addiction every unhealthy thought this is the cure I can't be right if I can't see right I want to see right see here's another example people who do not discover that they are forgiven will not forgive only forgiven people know how to forgive. And if you're having a hard time forgiving someone, maybe you haven't discovered how forgiven you are, how many sins God has forgiven you of. This is so important for us to get this. I don't want to suffer from the serpent's bite unnecessarily. I want to look to Jesus. Check this out. What if there was a place here in Houston, here in Houston, that you could go to and they had something that you'd just look at. And they say, if you look at that, you'll live forever. You, you'll be healed, all your disease, everything that's wrong with you, all the bad stuff, all your, you look, you look to that, and you'll be healed. You know what we'd do? We'd get in our cars, and we, every day we'd go, and we'd just look at that. We'd get our, hey, kids, look at that. That's what the church is. We're, we're trying to teach people how to view Jesus. How to see Jesus better, not just a, as a historical figure, but as the eternal Son of God. Our only reason for existing as a church, I hear it, the seniors talk about this, is that we could point people to Jesus until everyone hears the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every song, every sermon, everything we do at Grace Church is so that people would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're lifting up the cross. You know what? He's healing our homes. He's healing marriages. He's healing our lives. He's healing our souls. And let me tell you what, Grace Church is a Grace Church. Grace Church is a Grace Church. We make room for people with mistakes, and you've blown it. You've, you, we're giving you space to repent. Nobody's, hey, this is not a place for perfect people. There's no one perfect here. The only perfect one is the one we're singing songs about and the one that we're worshiping, and that is Jesus Christ. So eternal health, and here's the second point, eternal wealth. Somebody say eternal wealth. You know, uh, you know the, uh, the rod of Ecliptus, uh, 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 the rod of, Ecl uh, I can't even say it, but you know this snake on a pole? It's not just, 
It's not just something that a doctor wears. It's not just about health. It's also about wealth because the Federal Reserve Building has this Greek character holding up this same snake on a pole, and it represents the dollar sign. That's where the dollar sign, the snake on a pole. The two main things, health and wealth. Jesus came to fix that, to give us eternal health and eternal wealth. When we look to Christ, we see that we are made rich through the poverty of Jesus. We are rich. Not just short-term health, but long-term health. Not short-term wealth, long-term wealth. Treasures beyond your wildest dreams. This is the true definition of salvation. It's, it's not just an escape from all that's bad. No, it is a gift of everything that is good. It's God's payoff plan. When you look to Jesus, he paid every debt of sin that you owed. And then he put a large deposit that you're going to inherit in your account. You have an eternal inheritance. Second Corinthians 8, 9. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that, that by his poverty he could, he could make you rich. We are enriched by the poverty of Jesus. But only if we see him through the eyes of faith. The best way to survey the wondrous cross is to see that God not only loves us and forgives us of our dark past, but he's given us a bright future. At this point in the service, I thought people would be slapping high fives and belly bumping and running and jumping. <laughs> Folks, this is... His gift of love has paid every debt that I owe. And I will, every debt that I'm going to owe, it's paid for. Paid for. Hey, we need to stop poor mouthing. Come on. We, we need to stop telling people how bad things are. Oh, it's just bad, bad. Stop talking about what we don't have and let's talk about what we do have. We need to open up our eyes and see what we have. Come on, what if you were a millionaire? What if you had the wealth of Bill Gates and didn't know it? What if there was this huge deposit in your account and you just walked around and said, I don't have... Come on, you are a child of God. You have been born again. So many people don't know how rich they are, so that's why they live by the wrong patterns. Habitually responding to life in sour tones, unhealthy and unforgiving and greedy. My prayer is that our eyes would be open. We can just see it. Ephesians 1.18, Paul said this to the church in Ephesus. He said that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened so that you can know what the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That you just would see it. I, I want you to see it. I want to see it. works for us. It benefits us. I think sometimes we live so far beneath our privileges and purpose, just barely making, just, well, I think I'm, I'm just going to hang in there. I'm barely making. No. Maybe you've been confused. Maybe you say, well, I got everything in the world going for me. I got a good job. I got, I got a good family. I'm successful in my career. I'm just, just not happy. I don't know what's going on something gnawing at you, just stealing your joy. Maybe it's past mistakes and past guilt. Maybe just a lust for more and you're not content and just a misconception about life. Maybe because you think you deserve more. Hey, we don't, we don't deserve what we have already. We'll never deserve anything. It's not about what we deserve. It's not about what we do. It's about what he's done. It's about what he's done. We were spiritually poor, miserable, blind, naked, bankrupt. But now that we've looked to Jesus, we are rich beyond our wildest dreams. God wants to help you not perpetuate a dysfunctional lifestyle, help you undo all the patterns of defeat brought to you through your DNA of your family tree and make you born again, a son of the living God, seeing through eyes of faith, your inheritance. You say, well, I, I've tried to be good. I, I, I keep failing. I, I've gone to church for years and, 
I tried to live the good life. It, hey, it just doesn't work. It's not working for me. Well, hey, what, you know what? You can start all over again tonight. This could be the first day of the rest of your life looking past your sin to the eternal Christ. Don't look to yourself. Don't look at how good you are. Don't look at what your, cre your credentials are. Don't look at your creativity or what your talent. It's not about who you are. It's about who he is. You know, if you're, if you're like most people, you, you had your share of bad things happen in your life. Maybe in the past few years you've been discouraged. Maybe you're just ready to give up and bitter about some things. You can let go of all that. You just let, let go of it and be amazed at God's grace again. Pay the debt. Rich. Full. The enemy may be trying to get you to quit. There may be someone saying, you know, I just think I'm going to just hang this up. You may feel like you're at the end of your road. You feel empty. I'm preaching to somebody right now. You're at a place in your life, a crossroads. Not much going your way. Been through some severe difficulties. Times have been hard. That's okay. You're going you're gonna to make it. You have the eternal Christ on your side. Even the very least in this room, even the very least in this room has so much more they could ever hope for. I like what Paul said. When Paul, when Paul first got saved, he said, he said, I am the, the least of the apostles. And then later on, he said, I'm the least of the least of the saints. And then he, at the end of his life, he said, I'm the chief of sinners. Just, he just kept realizing, my bad, my bad, my bad. It wasn't that he was fatalistic or being, de he wasn't depressed. He just realized that he was not good, only one that was good, and that's Jesus. Amen. Let me wrap up. You know, it's interesting to me that the children of Israel, after they looked at the snake and were healed, they kept, they kept worshiping the snake. They started worshiping the snake. They did. For 400 years, they named it. They called it Nehushtan. They had a name for him. And they, they burned incense to it, and they worshipped it. They worshipped the snake. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't see that this was just a brass serpent that was a metaphor of the ugliness of sin. So they worshipped it. Look at it in 2 Kings. Hezekiah was a 25-year-old king, the youngest, one of the young kings, but he was... He was on fire for God. And so the Bible says he went through the land. He went kicking things over. I love this guy. He removed the places where the false gods were worshipped, it says in verse 4. It says he smashed the stone pillars. Man, that sounds like a good church service, right? He cut down the Asherah idols. And also the Israelites had been burning incense to Nehushtan, the bronze snake that Moses had made. But he broke it into pieces. Man, it was awesome. See, they had missed the point altogether. Instead of seeing how sinful and wicked they were, instead of seeing what they should have seen, that they were, had a proclivity toward idolatry and superstition, they begin to worship the wrong thing. And that, you know, it's kind of the way humans are today. You know, the cross itself, the physical cross, um, has become an idol. It really has. You know the cross is a money maker? There are cross factories that manufacture crosses on a production line basis. There are silver crosses, diamond studded crosses, ivory crosses. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ was not silver hung on a polished ebony cross, but he was a human being, the son of God, whose blood oozed into the dirt for my sin and your sin. Our fixation is not on the shape of the cross, but on the person of Jesus Christ. You know, football players or whatever kiss the cross and people do the sign of the cross and then vampires got to hold the cross up. It's just, it's crazy what people think about the cross. The cross was just a cruel form of torture that the Romans came up with 23 centuries ago and Hundreds and thousands of people were crucified on those same kind of crosses. There's nothing inherently valuable about the cross itself. But the person that hung on that cross, Jesus. So, here's the question. How much do you love Jesus? How much do you value Jesus?
you can answer that question with another question. How anxious are you to see him return to earth? Oh, wait a minute. I love the idea of Jesus, but I don't want the real Jesus to come back. Well, then you don't love Jesus. Can I, I got to tell you this. This is my testimony. Um, it was about three years ago. Somewhere around there, three years ago, I was in the backyard. And I was swimming in the pool. This was up in Indiana and pastoring for 20-something years and just taking laps and beautiful sky. And I just stopped and I looked up and just a beautiful day. And it's the first time this has ever happened to me. Jesus spoke to me and he, and he, just, he just said it. He said, you don't love me, Simeon. And I wasn't, pray, I wasn't praying. There was no choir music or songs. In the, it, was, it was not even a spiritual moment. I was swimming. And he said, you don't love me. Just out of the blue. And I, I, I yeah, I love you, Lord. I, I do. I love you. I preach about you. I preach about you at church. I've been teaching people about Jesus, about you, Lord. I love you. He said, you do not love me. And this is the first time this has ever happened in my life. I've never had this happen. I just had this argument with the, with the Lord Jesus. And um, I was in the shallow end of the pool over in the, it was the uh, southwest corner of the pool. I just kind of put my arms up there and I just looked up and I just said, I love you, Jesus. He said, you don't love me. And he proposed this analogy. He said, you, you love Sonia, right? I said, I love Sonia. He said, what if Sonia were gone for 20, 30 years? And someone came to me and said, hey, Sonia's coming back to town. He said, if there would be an ounce of dread in your heart about Sonia coming back to town, you could not say that you love Sonia. And I just started weeping. I said, you're right, Jesus, I don't love you. I want to love you. I want to know you. But, and it just, I started weeping. <laughs> I've always been scared about you returning. I just, people preach from Revelation and just, oh, God, please let me leave. I don't want to hear a sermon on Revelation about the end times and Antichrist. And, and he said, that's the, that's the point. People are focusing on the wrong thing. He said, they're not focusing on, on me coming back. He said, and he told me, he said, I walked this earth 2,000 years ago and I held children and I loved them and I healed old ladies. And I'm coming back to make all things new. Why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you want to see me? And I'm here to tell you tonight that the first time in my life, three years ago, preaching the gospel for the first time in my life, I had a true uh, desire for Jesus to return. Not for the world to end, not, not for the sky to fall, but for Jesus, Jesus to come back and to just make all things new. And from that experience, the Lord gave me a revelation that it's just so simple, but let me share it with you. If you were to... If you were to picture a cross, on the left side of the cross, you would see the words, first coming, first coming. And under that, he gave his all. Everyone say, he gave his all. That's on the left side of the cross. Then on the top, you see the word Savior. Everyone say, he paid it all. So he came the first time and he gave his all. Lived a sinless life. Gave everything. Died on the cross, became Savior, and paid our debt of sin. That's where I've been most of my life. His first coming, born of a virgin, gave everything. Died on the cross, became my Savior, and paid everything but I was missing the most important part. And that at the bottom is the word Lord. Everyone say Lord. Lord. He owns it all. Everyone say he owns it all. So he gave his all. He paid it all. He owns it all. In other words, he, he paid my debt of sin, but then he purchased me. I'm not my own anymore. He bought me with a price. So now he's my Lord. He owns it all. And then on the right side is the word second coming and that he reigns over all. So he came and gave his all. He paid it all as my Savior. He owns it all as my Lord, and he reigns over all. He will reign over all in his second coming. 
If we don't have a second coming, it cancels out the reason for his first coming. He's got to come back. My prayer is that he would come quickly. And you know what? Hey, I, I can't convince you to want Jesus to come back. You can't fake that. But you can pray that you would look for his coming. Won't you stand with me? I've preached too long. I want to pray for you. Won't you pray with me? Father, thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for my sins. Help me to know that I'm healed eternally and that I'm made wealthy eternally, that I have this huge inheritance. But the most valuable thing that I could ever attach to or to look for is Jesus Christ. Help me to see his value in my life forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, God bless you tonight. What a great church this is. What a great God we serve. Amen. Hey, if the prayer team could come up and um, we're going to worship just for a moment and maybe this could be your prayer. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you've not wanted Jesus to return and just doesn't really fire you up. But just pray that your love for Jesus could grow deep. There are those that maybe have to go pick up their children and you have to tuck them in early. That's fine. It's okay if you, if you have to leave. But there may be a few people that want to spend some time in prayer and worship. And uh, let's just draw closer to Jesus. Amen. Can we just raise our hands? Let's thank God for his love. Let's thank God for his love. Just in your own way, just thank him for his love and his goodness in your life. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. We say, when all of a sudden I'm unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how beautiful you are. God bless you tonight. Have a great week. See you again Sunday. Don't forget Wednesday, next Wednesday night, special, special night. Everybody come out. It's going to be great. Love you. How he loves us. He is jealous for you.